Hi, everyone. We're going to get started. My name is Kate Sugg, and I'm a program administrator with the Westchester County Youth Bureau. Welcome to diversity, equity, and inclusion for youth development programs. Just a reminder to kindly mute your microphones. Uh, we will open up for conversation uh, later in the program for a Q&A, and at that point, I will invite you to feel free to unmute and ask questions. Also, we are recording the session, and we will have a recording to the video library contained on our website, along with recordings from past trainings. If you would like to visit the video library, our website is youth.chestergov.com. And I would now like to turn it over to our presenters for the next hour. Maria Dotruche, Center for Racial Equity Director for the YWCA of White Plains, and Maria's colleague, Leslie Mazzotta, the Youth Director also with the YWCA of White Plains in Central Westchester. So take it away, Maria and Leslie. Thanks so much, Kate. I appreciate that warm welcome. And um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Before I introduce myself, I would like to invite my colleague at the YWCA White Plains in Central Westchester, Leslie Mazzotta, to introduce herself first. As I um, handle a slight glitch in my yeah. text. So, All right. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Maria. Um, hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be with you all today. Um, I'm Leslie Mazada. I'm the Youth Leadership Director at the YWCA. I'm actually relatively brand new. Um, I started at the end of November, but I've sort of jumped in to develop some really wonderful programming for um, young women in high school and college. Um, and I'm delighted to be here today and to really just start it's the first thing Maria and I are doing together. So I'm excited that it's for um, all of you and that you're here with us today. Maria. Thank you so much, Leslie. So it is my hope that everyone can both hear and see me. I'm getting some notifications on my device that my bandwidth is low. If this continues to be an issue, especially for the recording, I will simply um, remove myself from video, but continue to be with you in audio. I don't want this to be a distraction for anyone. Um, so my name is Maria Dautruch. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the inaugural director of the Westchester Center for Racial Equity, which is a program of the YWCA White Plains and Central Westchester. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Um, you are all the experts in how youth development programs run and how to run them well, and we are certainly just so grateful for your work and for your commitment to young people throughout our county. Um, that said, we are going to move on to the next slide and just tell you a little bit more about why us, why Leslie and I are here to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. You could have had any corporate trainer, any person with years of DEI experience, and you have us. Well, the YWCA is a centuries old um, social services and social justice organization in this country, and specifically our YWCA right here in White Plains is um, 92 years old. And for many of those years, not just since 2020, not just since 2016, not just since 2012, for many of those years, the um, mission of the YWCA has been to eliminate racism, empower women, promote dignity, freedom, liberty, and justice for all people. Um, and that's a lofty and ambitious mission, but it's so important and it's so critical and centering to all of the work that the YWCA does. Um, the Center for Racial Equity that the Y has launched was launched just last spring. So we're not even a year old. We'll celebrate our anniversary in April. Um, and I have been on staff at the Y since um, August of 2021. So um, while the center is new and while my time at the Y is fresh, again, this commitment to equity, this commitment to anti-racism, this commitment to justice is longstanding. And also um, Leslie can speak to the programs that she is responsible for running at the Y. They are long established and well, uh, well 
represented and respected throughout the county as well, as are so many of the programs that all of you here also run. Um, Leslie, anything to add about why leaders and gems before we jump on? No, I just think that, um, you know, as Maria said, the goal of eliminating racism and empowering women and girls is really a part of the Y Leaders program. Um, in the leadership program that we offer throughout the school year and also through summer camps, we really bring a lot of the racial equity work that Maria does into the training. And we'll also be obviously bringing it diversity, equity, and inclusion in it because we believe that that is what's necessary for leaders of the future. So we really make it a priority. Thanks so much. And just a quick note, um, we're completely fine if as questions come up for you, you put them in the chat um, and we can note and get to those as we have breaks throughout the presentation, but it is a tight time together. And so we're gonna give as much information as we can, hoping to answer some questions that might be emergent for you as we go forward, but also noting that if you have a burning question in real time, please use the chat feature, um, or if that's not available or accessible for you at this time, do take a quick note. We don't want you to forget it, but we will have time at the end for more deeper question and answer. Thank you. Next slide, please. Hey, so just wanna share some general demographics about the county before we delve into what is DEI and how do I Im implement it in my program if we want to, or is it even worthwhile? Um, just wanna give you a sense of what we all kind of know and feel um, as we just continue to do our work in our home county. Um, this is information visualized for you from Census Bureau information. Um, the bar on top for each um, section, for each area, along the y-axis, you'll see various racial groups, and along the x-axis, you'll see percentages. So um, the racial groups from top to bottom, two or more, so people who identify as biracial or multiracial, other is always one of my favorite categories in the census, and how many folks self-select um, self that is also an important data point. Pacific Islander and Asian, it's good to see those disaggregated, though there could be even more disaggregation in our data. American Indian, white, black, Hispanic. And just a note, um, I don't want to presume that people are aware or are clued in, but um, we use this data based on the categorization that the Census Bureau gives us. Um, but if you speak to anyone who is from a Spanish speaking background and identifies as Hispanic, you may very well know yourself that that person may racially identify as white or racially identify as non-white. So Hispanic is actually not an indication of racial self-identification or classification. It is an indication of language of origin in national um, heritage for the most part, but this is the data we have. So just to give a sense of where we are in the gold bar in each group is where we are um, right now. And the more orange bar right beneath it is where we were 10 years ago. So just being interactive here, if you wanna drop into the chat something you notice, right? We're all looking at the same data, if you can see it. Um, I think some people are on audio calls, so I will go through the data as well. Um, here we see with the two or more races, about 10.9% in 2020 versus 3.15% in 2010. Other 14.6% in 2020, 8.27% in 2010. Pacific Islander, not enough data to statistically give us a number, so we won't make any presumptions, but I will say that that means statistically not enough to hit a number. It doesn't mean that no one in our county identifies as Pacific Islander. We don't know that based on what we're looking at. Asian, 6.5% in 2020, 5.4% in 2010. American Indian, 0.7% in 2020, up from 0.4% in 2010. Those who identify as white, 53% in 2020 versus 68.1% in 2010. Black, 14% in 2020 versus 14.55% in 2010. And Hispanic, again, which we've talked about, um, at 26.8% in 2020 and 21.8% in 2010. So just looking at it, hearing the numbers, um, are there any 
conclusions you come to based on the data as it relates to racial demographics in our county over the past 10 years? Latinos are moving, Hispanics are increasing and Caucasians are decreasing. Yes, thank you, Ivan. Um, we see that the Hispanic population on the rise, we see the white population on the decline. Um, and in general, I think we can say that um, a more multiracial demographic um, of non-white people is the reality for our county, right? Like we are trending in the same way that most of the country is trending. And Greg, I see you in the chat, white and black were the only ones to decline. Yep. Um, there, are, I could talk about this all day. I'm a big census nerd and a big racial demographic nerd, um, but we can move on from this. I just wanted to point out that one of the reasons that we're proponents of um, DEI work is because Diversity, the reflection and representation of people around us is already happening. We live in a diverse ecosystem, a diverse environment. Our natural environment is healthier when it's more diverse. And so is our human um, connection, healthier, stronger when it's more diverse. And so this is already happening. It's something that we should um, embrace and accept as a reality. And then look at how our programmings meet the needs of the people in our communities that we serve. Thanks so much. Next slide. If you have more ideas, you should definitely keep putting them in the chat. We're just going to move on. So here's a diversity wheel because that last slide really just focused on racial demographics, which are self selecting. Um, the diversity wheel, though, I think this is cool. If you just think of yourself. Um, and think of. The completion of your diversity, what makes you who you actually are and how do people see you and how are the ways that you're seen and categorized impacting your relationships and your um, interactions with other people. So there's your personality, right? And then outside of that core of who you are are all the other things about you that people might see on first glance. They might guess how old you are. Are you a child? Are you an adult? Are you a senior citizen? They can make presumptions about your gender, whether or not that is accurate is something you give people the clues to and the, and the answers about sexual orientation is the same. A lot of the things that I think my parents would say um, when they were my age, when they were hitting 40, um, you just knew someone was, the, was that age. You could just tell them that's their race. And now we are, you know, when I talk to people, I don't assume, I ask your pronouns first. I don't assume your sexual orientation. I, I invite an, a conversation about it. And when I look at physical ability, just because I see you doing things that I think a physically able person can do, I don't assume that you're not carrying um, a disability or not as physically able as I might be making assumptions about. The secondary dimension might always not always be things people can see, but they might draw conclusions about. And especially in your organizations, this is often a place of diversity where we don't talk a whole lot, but it definitely does impact power dynamics, which we will talk about later. So the program area in which you work, do we do we value more in our uh, in our organizations? the feedback from frontline community engagement staff or from the people in the executive office, right? Just a question, we don't have to answer it here. So job or position, seniority, where you work, um, all these other places, union affiliation, um, you know, there's a lot to think about in what really gives us the total package. And this is important to think about if you are considering or have recently launched a DEI program within your organization, taking into account the various perspectives and experiences people are bringing to that um, opportunity. Next slide, please. So without going any further, there's so many words we all hear, we all use, we're all learning the language, but um, these definitions of diversity, equity, and inclusion come from, Leslie, please help me um, remembering where we pulled this from in a very helpful document that Kate had shared as we were- The New York State Board of Regents framework on DEI that they're creating for the school system. Thank you so much. So this is uh, new to me, but I thought, you know, what better way to learn than together? Um, these are definitions that have just been put out by the New York State Board of Regents. 
So diversity, for those who may or may not be able to um, see it, I'm happy to read out, includes but is not limited to race, color, ethnicity, nationality, religion, socioeconomic status, veteran status, education, marital status, language, age, gender, gender expression, gender identity, sexual orientation, mental or physical ability, genetic information, and learning styles. So some of those things we could make connections to from the diversity wheel as well. Equity is defined as the guarantee of fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement for all while striving to identify and eliminate barriers that have prevented the full participation of all groups. And inclusion, authentically bringing traditionally excluded individuals and or groups into processes, activities, and decisions or policy making in a way that shares power and ensures equal access to opportunities and resources. So if you have any, um, I'll give us a minute to kind of sit with those definitions and if any phrases or any terminology or any questions from those definitions are resonating for you right now, feel free to put them in the chat and we can come back to those. But it's important to just in this session at this time, all come to an agreement that these are the definitions we're working from as we talk about DEI today. And again, they come from the New York State Board of Regents framework for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So a good source to start from. Oh, here's a question. Thank you, Diane. How would I distinguish between equity and equality? I used to have a fantastic graphic for this, which I have not included. Um, but I would say equality is we are going to do and I'll do it by um, illustration rather than straight definition. I'm a, I'm a visualizer, visual learner. Um, so we're going to do a craft project, Diane, and without um, knowing your ability or um, your or anything about you, I'm focused on the project and the project requires cutting. And so I've given us both um, paper and scissors. And you share as you start to manipulate the scissors that I have given you right-handed scissors and you are left-handed. So I say, okay, great. I'll get everybody left-handed scissors. Kelly shows up and Kelly says, well, I'm not left-handed, I'm right-handed. And what I do in the name of equality is just go back and forth giving everyone the same scissors. Equity would be if I was planning a craft project and I knew I'd be inviting you, Diane, and I knew Kelly would be coming. And I asked in advance, is there anything I can do to ensure that you can fully participate in this craft project, which will include cutting a piece of paper with a pair of scissors? And Diane, you share, well, I'm left-handed and I really would appreciate seeing left-handed scissors available. And Kelly shares, I'm right-handed. so. Right-handed scissors are fine for me. Equity means you each get what you need to participate. Equality is we're going back and forth <laughs> with this um with the left scissors, right scissors, left scissors, right scissors. And I don't, while it might be funny to watch, it will not be fun to do together. And thank you, Leslie, for dropping that resource in the chat for folks. There's a nice video that explains that in other ways. Next slide, please. So this, um, I, I want to include this history of DEI um, because things come from places. Yeah, even our language comes out of a culture, has a history, the charge of the words we use. And I think when we talk about DEI, we should come from it with a sense of where did this come from? Okay, um, so DEI through the years, um, yeah, and you will get these slides. So for this slide, I want to be clear and apologize in advance. I may not read word for word what's here, um, but you will get these slides. Um, but I do want to point out um, a, a, an overarching theme of DEI's evolution, its launch and its evolution. It has, in my opinion, and when you read through these things, um, especially the launch, the Equal Pay Act of 1963, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the Age Discrimination in Employment Act of 1967 put efforts focused on affirmative action and non-discrimination. And there we see the beginnings of DEI. So I don't want to discredit any unnamed visionaries who saw a DEI track and were not given credit for launching it. But I do want to name 
that DEI comes from a place and it comes from a place where it is responsive to litigation. It is about compliance. It is about meeting a need that has been um, legally protecting certain groups of people. And then what we see, one of the things I like to refer to later on in the um, 70s is ERGs, which are employee resource groups. They were started as race-based employee groups that developed due to racial tensions in the 1960s. And we can see in the um, bucket before some of the um, so some of the resolutions that came out of those racial tensions legislatively. Xerox is known for having the first employee research group in 1970. So what you're the, the connection I'm trying to make here is that organizations, mostly for-profit companies and schools and other places, had to respond to legislation. And a lot of that was about compliance, affirmative action, non-discrimination. Um, and then employees inside of organizations were like, we need to organize ourselves about what we need, what we wanna see happen. There's this opportunity to hold our companies accountable to upholding this legislation and we don't wanna miss it. So they started out as race-based groups. Now, employee resource groups can be for any affinity, right? Or sometimes they're even called affinity groups. So there might be a mom's group. There might be an LGBTQ plus group. There might be um, a group of folks who form an affinity group, might not be called employee resource group, but an affinity group around folks who went to the same college. You might find an employee resource group for veterans, all right? So they started somewhere in a specific moment in time in historical context and they've grown. And then over the years, you see, we get to inclusion. People are saying, well, we're getting these diverse pipelines, but something's happening with the company culture. Let's, let's call it inclusion. And academic research around emotional intelligence starts to push that part of the industry through. Um, in the early 2000s now, organizational efforts center around advancement. So getting people in the door into entry level jobs that they may or may not be overqualified for are not doing enough to keep people going through companies in retention and promotion. So what's going on there that we can look at? And maybe it has to do with leadership. So can we diversify boards of directors? And then equity is added to diversity and inclusion originating from gender based equal pay impetus. Again, another outside complaint, outside agitation, outside legislation that companies and other groups have to respond to. And so um, equity is added. And I wanna end with this quote from Allison Avery, who's the VP of Inclusion and Community at Dow Jones. And her quote is, we have moved to a place where it is riskier not to talk about DEI. We have to talk about race, we have to talk about inequity. We need to be more specific, more contextual and nuanced with our DEI objectives. So when most people think about setting up DEI, they're talking about a program, maybe a set of policies, maybe a way to incentivize a certain level of practices. Maybe they're doing the deeper work of looking at their values and asking how do we operationalize that. And they're not only looking at race, they're also thinking about gender, about um, about veteran status, about um, ability, physical, mental, et cetera. And those programs can have many, many benefits for organizations. And as we talk about the benefits, I do not want to gloss over the fact that they can be culture shifting and in their culture shifting be both transformative and very um, turbulent. They can, they can be difficult. It can be hard to get to the place where you want to go. If anyone on this call wants to put in the chat, um, if, if there was something you really wanted to do that would transform the trajectory of your life, and I'll start with an I statement. For me, it's like becoming a homeowner. That's not easy. If it wasn't easy for me, if it was easy for you, please put in the chat. I'd love a co-signer on a mortgage. If it's easy, I want to just jump on your boat. Um, but if there's anything worth doing that's going to be transformative, sometimes it's hard. And I just want to acknowledge that working with young people is also incredibly important and can be difficult. And we're talking about where we're offering you an opportunity to consider adding another hard and very worthwhile thing on top of that. So I just want to name that in no uncertain terms do we think just because DEI programs fall into good grace with us that we think they're easy. 
that we think this is just a light lift for you and your organizations. They take time, they take um, resources, and they take attention and monitoring because we're really, again, that deeper work of looking at your values and how you operationalize them. If you have a value of everyone is welcome here, then you probably need to look at your inclusion practices, okay? So um, I just wanna check the chat before moving on. Oh, an appreciation for the inclusion definition as authentically bringing it, yeah. Hopefully there's time in the um, Q&A to talk about what happens when it's inauthentic and how everyone knows. <laughs> everyone knows, everyone can feel it. It's a gift of being human. Next slide, please. So yeah, I mentioned some of the benefits and I would love to just linger here. Um, there's growing evidence that diversity and inclusion efforts empower workforces to be more innovative and more productive. The feeling of belonging that DEI can promote, and again, I just, belonging is a basic human need. It's a basic human need. So if you are in a work environment, you don't feel like you fundamentally belong. One of your basic human needs is not being met there, right? And it, it, DEI can be helpful in creating a sense of belonging for both your staff and your clientele. So the feeling of belonging that DEI can promote helps improve the mental health and well-being of your workers and reduce stress levels. DEI training and programs may also help employees recognize and acknowledge their own biases, including entrenched ways of thinking, and lead them to actively work to overcome both while opening their minds to new approaches. So I'll, I'll share here a quick, um, quick thing, and then I think I'll queue up Leslie to add if she has any um, from her experience, specifically in youth programs about benefits of DEI, but um, around this idea of entrenched ways of thinking. So um, one of my entrenched ways of thinking that going through um, specifically racial equity work and inclusion and belonging work, um, I've gotten so much better at my capacity to handle the complexity of non-binary thinking. We're on pretty much an autopilot in our society with binary thinking. We can either do it fast or we can um, do it slow. Like, you know, pick some, some things that are opposites. We like to do it that way. Well, we can, we can either spend a lot of money and it'll be great, or we can spend a little bit of money and we're not gonna be satisfied, right? Um, there's a way in which doing DEI work um, authentically, I'm gonna keep using that word, and deeply um, can help us just hold the truth in our minds that there are other ways and that there are multiple simultaneous ways, right? There are ways in which adults tend to, um, and adults specifically, I'd say people over 50 in this day and age tend to think about a solution and then there are ways that people under a certain age tend to think of a solution. I'm thinking about ways to involve technology, ways to communicate, ways to invite people in to share information. Um, there are just other multiple ways. And I think being in an environment that fosters a healthy sense of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is one of the places where you'll find the most people concentrated together who can hold the multiple ways. All right, no offense to binary thinking. I just, as we think about employee innovation and productivity and creativity and wellness, there's something about being able to hold that that I think is really beautiful about DEI. So DEI does breed creativity, innovation, enhanced employee belonging and engagement overall. Ultimately, these all drive improved business outcomes and success, including revenue growth, and improve profitability. Um, it almost reminds me of an old adage about happy cows make better milk or something like that. I don't know if you've all heard it, um, but there's something about working in a place where you feel like you belong, where you feel like your voice is heard, where you feel like you can bring more of yourself to work and connect with people authentically, where all of a sudden a little valve is open and resource can be found. If you're not working in a DEI framework, I think that there is a tendency to fall more into a place of restriction than there is to invite a sense of resource, which is really 
for me, not working in youth programs, but having so much deep respect for those of you who do, our young people are resources. They are a resource and to tap into them, I think it's really important to consider how DEI can be a useful strategy for um, that connection. So Leslie, did you wanna, I just wanna invite you to say some things about benefits, um, sure, especially sure. working with young people. Well, and I, I love that you brought up binary thinking because I think that one of the biggest um, stumbling blocks is having that type of thinking when working with young people and not just um, around ish, you know, the, what you're teaching them, but how you actually interact with them, um, how you think they should be communicating with you, how you think they should be um, doing certain assignments, how you think they should be looking at the world because they're living in a very, very different world, particularly now than we, than we were. And so to be able to create this culture of belonging that I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna sort of piggyback on you, Maria, and how we really create a space where everyone is welcomed, included, respected, um, and we get rid of the right, wrong, the good, bad thinking, because I think that youth naturally are good at this. They're good at op having openness and curiosity for other people, for welcoming people within the midst of diversity and that we as leaders need to sort of step up and be able to um, step into their openness and curiosity and live within the uncomfortable and awkward situations that sometimes this difficult work can bring up. Thank you, Leslie. And I'm just putting in the chat um, an appreciation um, for you for naming curiosity, which is actually a really important element for this work um, in DEI. So just documenting that and wanna also thank you for bringing that word up. That's really important, curiosity. Um, next slide, please. So this is one of my favorite slides ever. I mean, you could have asked me to talk to you about like the situation in the U on the Ukrainian front and I would have still brought this slide up. I just love this slide. Um, so on, on one side, on, on if, you're, if you can't see it, I'll describe it. On the left side, there's a picture that um, shows an iceberg in the ocean. And we have like a view from the, like looking at it as if we're in line with the ocean where we can see both the tip of the iceberg that comes above sea level and then the bottom, which is a much larger chunk of ice under sea level. Um, and next to that is a picture of two fellows on a bench. If you're familiar with Humans of New York, um, this is actually a screenshot of one of Humans of New York's posts from a few years ago, even though it says 21 minutes ago. This is an old post. Please do not spend time this afternoon on social media looking for it. It was not posted today. And it's two gentlemen on a bench. And if you're familiar with Humans of New York, um, the host of it, the, the creator of it, asks people throughout New York City questions. And so here's the conversation. Um, one gentleman says, we're eye doctors. And, the other, and they're asked by, um, Brandon actually is the name of the Humans of New York creator. They're, they're asked, what's something about the eye that most people don't realize? And one says, the eye doesn't see, the brain sees, the eye just transmits. So what we see isn't only determined by what comes through the eyes. What we see is affected by our memories, our feelings, and by what we've seen before. Wow, I'm gonna read that again because that for me is mind blowing. I don't know if anybody else is like really moved by that scientific fact, but um, what we see isn't only determined by what comes through the eyes. What we see is affected by our memories, our feelings, and by what we've seen before. And in the context of, for me at the Center in Racial Equity and Anti-Racism, and also in the context of DEI work um, from that, what we see is also therefore impacted by our memories of what we remember being told about people, how we remember being treated the first time we saw someone different from us, probably as a young child, and asked, What's, why does that person look like that? 
And instead of our curiosity being supported, some of us might have had the experience of being told, shh, we don't talk about differences. And so what you see then every time you see a difference is some taboo thing. And how is that impacting the way you actually see and engage with the world, right? Um, deep stuff here on this Tuesday afternoon. Um, and also the cultural messages, the media. What do you see? What do you see when you think of when I say, when I say suburban mom, what do you see in your mind? Because I can, I don't want to assume what you see, but what I can say is that we've been fed a number of cultural and me messages in the media that a suburban mom is white, around 40 years old, drives a minivan, fairly slim, um, nice, she's nice, um, not addicted to any substances, she's good to her children, she's not poor, she doesn't look working poor, she may not even work. Um, but do you remember the slide I showed you at the beginning that showed the racial demographics of Westchester County, which is a suburban county? Maybe the suburban mom looks different than what we immediately default to without a little more intention, right? So this is one of my favorites. Um, yeah, where's a tracksuit? Tracksuits are amazing and so are fanny packs. Just saying. Wouldn't give mine up for the world. <laughs> Um, so there, there's a lot. And so I think when I say at risk youth, what do you see? If I show you a young person who is brown skinned and, um, presents as male and looks to be about 15, 16 years old is wearing the normal teenage clothes of the day, maybe a, um, a hoodie and some loose khakis and a pair of sneakers and he appears to be standing um outside of a building looking at his phone is that an at-risk youth what do you what do you see i see a regular teenage teenager america sees a dangerous black male there we go ivan and that difference could be for that young person the difference between others assuming he has a right to live and others assuming he's a threat to their own life. And these are the things our kids know they're carrying. And so when they come to our programs, we hope that we can give them a safe space to be themselves, to be heard, to be seen, to be supported, to be to help navigate that. Um, yeah, thanks, Ivan. Thanks for speaking up. So even though this is my favorite, let's keep going because Leslie has even better things and I'm just in the way of that. So here is a culture map. Oftentimes at this point, folks go, oh, well, how, how? Like, okay, maybe I should do a DEI program. Maybe I should talk to kids about how they feel, but, but what's going on? My first piece of advice is always to check yourself, check in with your organizational culture. And how do you do that? I think a culture map is an easy tool to do that. Um, here it, it, it we have your culture map and MAPP is actually an acronym for mental maps, what people think and feel, looking at worldviews and meaning making, which is a phrase I love much more than learning because meaning making is really a community um, exercise. Um, so this takes a look at your values, assumptions, roles, feelings, beliefs, attitudes, needs, purpose, all that stuff at the bottom of the iceberg that we can't always see. We're starting there. Identify those. And then we often feel like the next thing is to spur to action. I might feel differently, but here, action. So what are you doing, right? What are the behaviors that we can point to? The tip of the iceberg, right? Um, the conduct, the decisions, the symbols and, and messages, the language, the rites and rituals, right? Um, then we're looking at our processes. These are ways for reinforcing mechanisms, ways that work and get controlled or monitored. So your systems, you know, think about your intake system. How do we bring young people into our program? Are, do we think there are a lot of barriers? Do the young people think there are a lot of barriers? Are there things we could make more accessible? Um, and then your patterns. What are your ways of relating? These are sometimes the unwritten rules of engagement. 
So um, an unwritten rule of engagement is um, you walk into a classroom and the unwritten rule of engagement is the big desk is for the teacher. The big desk is for the teacher. The big desk is for the, the person with the expertise, with the information who has come to impart onto everyone else what they have inside of them. And that pattern, that way, that unwritten rule of engagement is not only a physical setup for a classroom, it also has implications for how we think the power dynamic in the classroom will go for conversation, who gets heard, who can speak. It's all managed by this big desk, little desk setup um, sometimes, but that's an, that's an example of an unwritten rule of engagement. So I think when you get this, um, this slide deck, feel free to, you know, use this for yourself and maybe for your team and try to articulate what are your own mental maps and as a team in meaning making, what are the, what are the values and beliefs you hold? And then just go through and see where you land, right? See where you land with that. Next slide, please. And this is my last slide before turning it over to Leslie. Um, it's one of my favorite quotes from James Baldwin. Um, and it is, I'm just turning off my camera because of my bandwidth. I did um, say earlier, this might have happened, but children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. So if I could make a case, for DEI and racial equity and anti-racist culture in your organizations. It would be because the children, our young people, are looking to you as their mentors, as their advocates, to either um, imitate what you're doing or to reject it and make another choice. And I think um, I'm making a presumption here that most of us want to be the types of people that our young people want to imitate because we are fair and we pursue justice and we um, are welcoming and, um, and we want to see equity and inclusion in our diverse community um, advanced so that people can show up as their full selves in order to contribute to society and feel safe. So with that, I will turn it over to Leslie. Um, I'm glad my camera hung out for a while, but now we get into the juicy Perfect timing. Stuff. Thanks, Maria, and hello, everyone, again. Um, and I think Maria has said so much of what I also wanted to um, encourage us all to think about. Um, I think that we can all agree, as Maria just said, when it comes to youth development, we really want to allow our youth to feel a culture of belonging. And to me, that means, as Maria also said, that everyone feels welcomed, included, and respected for who they are, and especially their differences from other people. As we talked about, this is a really lofty ambition. This is really challenging in today's world, but it's so important because I think that, as Maria also said, our youth are looking to us. And I think they, they as I mentioned, are naturally curious, naturally open, and they're really good at welcoming difference and diversity because of the world that they're growing up in, this global world that is so small and so connected to one another. And so I think that we need to be brave and curious too, and not shy away from building opportunities to embrace diversity and to allow for the discomfort and sometimes awkward situations and conversations that that bring up. So that our youth are able to talk about themselves, but also recognize the differences in other people to feel free to explore their thoughts and understandings to know how to address stereotypes head on and understand the challenges and the damage that those can cause and also recognize that differences makes us all vibrant and special as individuals and also make the whole stronger, stronger classrooms, stronger teams, stronger societies, stronger offices. And so if we look at James Baldwin, how do we become worthy of imitation? How do we give our youth an opportunity to emulate who we are? 
And I think we can do this in a couple ways. And I just wanted to spend the next sort of few minutes before we have questions, giving us some ideas of how we could do that. I think first and foremost, we have to start individually with ourselves and make an intentional commitment to learn more about DEI and see how that affects our thoughts, our words, and our actions. And to me, that means just paying attention. Start by paying attention. What are we currently seeing? What am I currently believing and thinking and doing regarding all the things that Maria just sort of talked to, talked with us about? And a great question that I always ask myself as I work with youth is, what does each youth person need to feel and do their best? And what can I do as their mentor, their leader, their, their teacher to make this happen? And as we ask these questions over and over again and see what comes up for us, we're able to make those small changes that then turn into big impact. So perhaps, as Maria said, it is providing left-handed scissors for left-handed students. Maybe it is offering meals to kids who don't have food security at home. Perhaps it is inviting a teen with a vision problem to move closer to the whiteboard. These simple things that we notice and take action on will then help the individual and the whole group thrive. And then I think once we are more comfortable doing it individually, we then can turn organizationally to elevate these issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and do things like look at our rules of engagement and our patterns and our processes, um, set new guidelines, establish new goals, modify and update our programming so that once again, everyone is feeling welcome and they're seeing us as a role model for how they live out DEI in their lives. And then that, I think, hopefully over time, will then allow for the systemic changes necessary in your organization so that, once again, all youth can feel like they belong and that they, in turn, become empowered to live and learn through multiple perspectives, value people of all backgrounds, and live this out so that the whole, the whole becomes more fair and balanced. And so just the next slide I wanted to show you, um, there's a wonderful quote from Nigerian author Chiamunda Ngozi Undichie, I'm so glad I said her name right, who warns about the dangers inherent in telling a story from one perspective. And this quote was highlighted actually in the, D, uh, the New York State Board of Regents framework on DEI and really focused on how schools need to make sure that students are learning from multiple perspectives, especially when we look at our country's history. But it's definitely relevant to our conversation, how we support youth development with DEI. And she says, for those who can't see, the single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. And I just think that's such a powerful um, quote for us to consider because it really, if we can do this, if we can welcome all stories and all experiences of our youth, then we're really going to be creating um, an amazing space and then community and then life for our young people. And thank you, Maria. You put a link into a TED talk. Is this um, Shiamunda's um, TED talk or somebody else? Oh, shoot. I can't hear. Well, we're going to take, we'll be surprised and we'll take a look. Um, so I'll just end um, by encouraging all of us to really be vigilant and guard against the dangers of the single story and to work individually and organizationally to create spaces where there's not just one definitive story and everyone can tell their full story for the benefit of the whole. And to get us started, we've offered just three resources that might be helpful as you continue to delve into DEI. The first is a link to the report that the New York State Board of Regents created on the framework of DEI. It not only has the definitions that Maria shared with us earlier, 
but it also has really important statistics about the impact of racial inequality on Westchester students. So that, that, that was really eye opening for me to look at. In addition, the YWCA Center for Racial Equity, I put the link in there. And we have a racial equity 101 to 103 series, which is a three part workshop process that lets people delve into racial equity. And we would be delighted to talk with you about it if it's something you think you'd like to offer in your community, not only to your staff, to, to, to your youth, to we have both an adult and a youth version. And then the last resource we found was for the Westchester Education Services. They have a wonderful web page of DEI resources, articles, videos, books, things like that, that really helps you sort of will help you sort of start to think about DEI as you you know, deepen your understanding and sort of implement it into your life and your work. So I think we have about eight minutes left. Maria, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we turn things back to Kate and see if there's any questions? Yeah, the fabulous job, Leslie. I'm glad to be presenting with you. you what you're so all much. looking at now is the yeah, of course, the Westchester Center for Racial Equity does have a monthly e newsletter, and I'll put the link in the chat to sign up to receive that if anyone is interested. Um, it's also just a good way to stay in touch if we don't get to all your today. Um, I come out this week, so this is a good time to sign up. Um, and, and I just want to pause and, and thank you all, but turn it back over to Kate for facilitation of any questions that you might have, or even any commentary. I think sometimes we have these big events and go, we're only gonna answer questions, but the space is also there. If you just have some comments, just wanna share some reflection, we'll, we'll open it for all of that. For Thank you so much, Marie and Leslie. Um, so I would like to open it up for any questions. So please, if you have any questions or comments, Please feel free to unmute. Um, you can go ahead and talk, or you can also use the chat feature. Um, also, if you have implemented any DEI strategies into your youth development program um, that you would like to share, um, please feel free. I do see a question in the chat um, for Maria and Leslie. How does DEI relate to global competence? Um, so, Joe Carvin with uh, One World asked that question. Um, Maria or Leslie, would you like to take that? Yeah, I can take a stab at that. Um, I can try that. Thanks, Joe, for that question. Um, I think DEI is um, a foundation for global competence. Um, I, when, when you think about the, the world and the, the people therein, I mean, I, as a black person, also identifying as a person of color, I'm in the global majority. So if there's someone who grows up in our county and goes to college or goes on a, 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 a exchange program at any age, 15, 17, 21, and at that point, we're saying things like, oh, this is the first time that I've had to engage with someone different from me. And I don't know how to navigate new cultural competencies and new cultural experiences and norms, right? We didn't even touch on the ways in which DEI opens us up to um, relieving ourselves of US centricism, um, the way that you know, the US for a number of reasons, even though folks speak tons of languages here, we're still culturally pretty unilaterally Anglo in our in our in the ways in which we move. And and the rest of the world doesn't actually look like that and doesn't actually work like that. Um, our rugged and And so I think that by offering a DEI framework to young people very early, we're doing them a great service in their ability to be global citizens and to be confident in the skills we're giving them to go out there and connect with other people, which I, my experience of traveling abroad as a young person and um, traveling abroad and studying abroad in college is the more I hold, the more confident and the more um, 
committed I became to who as a person and what I wanted to contribute to that world. And I'm hoping that we're all seeing young people as folks who are worthy of that journey. And, and so I'll, I'll pause there so that if Leslie has any additional thoughts or if there are other questions, there's time for that. But I think there's a whole conversation about the way the US centricism of this conversation and talking about DEI globally. So thanks for that question. Thanks, Maria. I mean, I would just add the idea of global citizens. I, the youth I work with, I encourage them to be global citizens, to understand if, if they're concerned about education for women and girls, how does that look differently here versus in India versus in other places in the world? What are the challenges? And I think all leaders that we're empowering our young women to be need to have that global perspective and I, I, my favorite thing is to travel overseas and meet people from other parts of the world, but we don't have to go overseas to meet people who are different than us. We just saw those demographics of the different backgrounds and ethnicities and races right in Westchester, but we sort of sometimes stay too close to home, our hometown and not spread out. And so if I encourage anything, I encourage our young people and everyone to step out and really get to know the people right next door to them in order to understand how DEI impacts, you know, a global, global confidence. Kate, can I respond? Yes, please, Joe. Well, listen, first of all, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And second of all, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we teach global competence and our, our view is majority minority communities have a distinct competitive advantage when it comes to developing global competence, right? And so, so because 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 I think people of color uh, are are in our society forced to become more cross culturally competent and develop cross cultural communication skills. And I therefore think that, in our view, at least, majority minority communities have distinct competitive advantage in building global competence. So, thank you so much for the presentation and your feedback. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and I see that we have with us our executive director at the Westchester County Youth Bureau, Dr. Damia Harris Madden, was able to join us. Damia, can I invite you to say a few words? Thank you, Kate. I, I just wanted to say um, this was an exciting and very informative presentation. Thank you, Kate, for arranging this. But also, I'm so excited to hear from Maria, longtime friend, and Leslie, who I've not met but certainly appreciate your remarks and this wonderful presentation. It certainly will be uh, great to share amongst our colleagues and specifically our programs. You know, um, the idea for this really came about because we want to make sure that our new applicants for the Westchester County Invest in Kids program funding uh, has an understanding of what DEI is, um, how critical it is, to integrate within everything that we do concerning young people and further to be able to articulate their efforts um, in the application. So, you know, we thought it was very important to include some narrative um, on why this is so critical. Um, everything that is happening today, the ripple effects of not just COVID, but also just the <laughs> global community at large, given everything uh, that we're experiencing, we want to make sure that our workforce is culturally competent, uh, that they understand the language, and they have a little bit of an idea, uh, not as a spoiler, but, you know, just some insight in terms of what we could be asking within the RFP, because, again, we want to make sure that all young people are being served in an equitable manner, and we want to make sure that our RFP uh, reflects the values of the Westchester County Youth Bureau. So, Thank you again for this presentation. It was really very great to listen in. Thank you so much, Damia. Um, and I echo that sentiment. A huge thank you to Maria and to Leslie um, for lending your time and your expertise with us. Um, all great information. Um, I also just want to point out that we have two more professional development opportunities coming up just over the next couple weeks um, if people are interested in signing up. Um, we have co-occurring disorders and youth mental health um, being offered on March 3rd. Um, and next week, we're actually offering a, a review on the updated COVID guidance for working with school age children. Um, so that we are going to squeeze in next week, February 24th, 
Um, if you're interested in signing up for these, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and thank you all for joining us. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so much, Kate. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, thank Kate. You. Bye, Thanks everyone. Much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.